what is a CFO? You know, somebody just asked earlier, I don't want to do bookkeeping, right? <laughs> so what is a CFO, OK? And I think one of the big challenges I've discovered in going through this process is that people don't know what it is. Clients don't know what it is, and accountants don't know what it is, OK? So I went through and have defined it in this chapter in a way that we can all have some context for what it is that we're talking about. And the first thing I want everybody to think about is this concept of form over substance, OK? So if you're doing a basic engagement where all you're doing is reconciliations of the month and close, you're not doing any higher level reporting, you're not doing any AP or AR, you're not doing any controller level services like accrual accounting or a consolidation or anything like that, you're just doing monthly accounting, close it up the books, I want you to call yourself a CFO. I always, I think if you're doing monthly accounting services, you should call yourself a CFO even if you're doing basic services, okay? And I'm gonna talk about why that is. So I'm gonna tell you to use the word CFO, whatever. If anybody in here, how many people have the name bookkeeping in the name of their company? Or have had? There's a couple. You gotta strip that shit out. <laughs> right, because you know, already off the gate, there's a concept of what, you're, what you are and what the value you're bringing to the table is. I want that out. Change it, okay? The kickoff call is important to me because if you just send a list to the clients, they're not gonna respond. And I tried that. Um, and then you're like, oh, well, they haven't sent me this, and the onboarding takes forever. So what I do is explain to them, this is how it's gonna go. You're gonna sign on board, we're gonna schedule a kickoff call. It's best to have any of the players that are gonna be working with us on this call. So we all do, generally I'll do a Google, um, like a meetup call or some Zoom or whatever video conferencing that you tend to use. Um, I do that for a couple reasons for video because I like to share my screen. I use the checklist, which we also have in the material for you. And I'll show you a little bit about what those items are. But I like to do the video conferencing because, um, you know, for one, they can see the, the, the checklist and they can actually visualize what it is I'm asking for. But it's also important that they see who I am. And I tell them, I said, I just want you to see who I am. I'm actually a real person. <laughs> you know, hopefully you get to know me and we get to know each other. You also know any of my other teammates that might be working with you and vice versa. Uh, I think it gives them a little bit more assurance and just, you know, kind of, you know, creating that relationship. Um, so the kickoff call, the purpose of it too really is to review the scope of work, to gain access to anything, um, to you know, um, talk about any sort of communication expectations and any other really important deadline. Most of the complexity, most of your time is gonna end up here, but it should not be the first priority. So I think it's a big thinking mistake that people have that they, they have something that takes a lot of time, so therefore it's the first thing they work on, right? It's the thing they allow the most into their lives. Right? They let the customers text them, email them. They let the customers email them directly. They work on it first thing when they get in in the morning. Right? They don't set the boundaries. So I want everybody to think about how are, and if, you, if I can make even this week, if you get one thing out of this weekend, this, I keep week, this week, is just to tweak your time allocation a little bit and just to tweak your priorities to the right priorities, let that, mo let that compound over time and watch what happens. Because it doesn't take but a small improvement. How many people in here know about the concept of compound interest? You guys heard of the concept of compound interest? I'll let you on a little secret here. Compound interest does not just apply to money. Compounding applies to knowledge. It applies to thinking. It applies to skills. It applies to many things. But if your interest isn't compounding and you're going into debt, you're never gonna end up anywhere. So if you've got the wrong priorities, you've got the wrong time allocation, you're not gonna get on the momentum. Here's the thing about the CFO business that's different than financial coaching, it's also different than tax and tax planning. These are big deals, and these people, these people will stick around for a long time, and if you get one client at 2,000 a month, that's 24,000 a year. If we get that person to stay around for five years, that's $125,000, it's a six-figure deal. So when we do get a client, and we get them on board, and we get them to stay, there's a lot of value that's created over the long term but we don't need that many individual clients on a weekly and a monthly basis for appointments and for meetings. So it is a problem and it might be the most complex thing for some of you in this room, but in all my research, it is not the most difficult thing to do for one of these companies. If you get a financial coaching client for $4,500, $4,500, that's one time. If you get a monthly recurring accounting client, Twelve thousand recurring for how many years? 
It's just different. In fact, I would say that, I'll give you another psychological component to this. People that cannot delay gratification, people that can delay gratification, right? Because this one, yes, you can get up fast or higher, but it can also drop in an instant. And you have to be on it like crazy. This one, it takes a little bit longer to get up, but it's an asset you can sell, and it's, it's very, it's almost impenetrable. I mean, it's very, like when you talk, when I talk to people in all my research that the, the business doesn't, like, especially if you don't have like one big client that's like 14 grand a month, if you can get a good distribution on clients where there's no client that's more than 10% of sales, that business ain't going away. It ain't going to go away once it gets to a certain size. It's very hard to take that business down. This business, if you get depressed for three months, oh, beep beep, bye bye, it's gone. So it's just different. I, don't, I, I would absolutely not say for anybody in this room that one is easier than the other. Neither of them were easy. They'll come with different types of challenges. And you've got to be honest with yourself about which one you want to do, what type of challenges you want to face, because they're going to be totally different. I mean, that one's going to take a lot more sales and marketing. This one's going to take a lot more service delivery, onboarding, hiring, and training, both of which can be incredible, but they're different. How many clients do you want to onboard a month? This is important for you to go through this. Now, divide that by 20%. Because while we, you'll probably close 30, 35%, I think 20% is reasonable. If you're closing more than 30, 35%, your pricing's too low. Your pricing is too low. So divided by 20%, how many strategy sessions, how many appointments do you need a month? So if your number is, if your number is I can onboard four clients a month, that means you need about 20 appointments a month, right? Is my math right on that? Or maybe it's 25, or maybe it's 30. How many years left till you retire? And if you assume the same growth rate between now and the time that you retire, on average, right? I mean, years go like this, right? How big's your company gonna be? Who's got a number for me? How big would your company be if you grew at that rate? Oh, let me, let's see. Uh, Judy, I'm gonna guess Judy, you, uh, Judy's probably 23. Um, uh, oh, 24, got you, 24. Just hit the drinking age, okay, you know? So, you know, whatever the age is, right? I don't need to know everybody's age, but if you take your age at the age, Judy's age of 24, uh, yep, then to the, to the age of 70, and she put her number down as 860,000. Like I said, even if you take 86,000 or you take half of that, 400,000, whatever the number is, what is the number? If it's 300,000, if I think I can grow my business by 300,000 a year times whatever that is, let's actually be, let's bring it here. We'll put 40, 30, make the math easy. 30 years. That's 9 million, is it? 9 million. You don't think anybody's ever built a $9 million company? We did 10 million in sales last year. All right. Thank you. And you know, I joke with people, I joke with my sales guys. I say, guys, sometimes people come into the program and they're telling you they can do things, okay? And you're thinking, this person's psychotic. Right? They think they're going to be so successful. They think they're going to be, they're going to be, you know, they're throwing out these numbers and you're like, this person is literally psychotic, right? But to be honest, the most successful people that have come through the program pretty much are psychotic. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's true. Some of you know, right? Because you have to be psychotic to believe that you could do something like that you haven't done. But the only way to get it is to believe that you could do it before you have it. Otherwise, you don't even try. So you have to believe it in your mind before it happens. That's the way it works. And yeah, definitely if I would have told people that at my age and my situation that we would have done that this year, they would have said, that guy's an idiot. That guy's stupid. He's arrogant, or whatever the case may be. But you just ignore those people and put your head down and get to work.